the rest of the crew had died. Mira was in a spacesuit, clinging to the side of the spaceship, trying to make necessary repairs to the life support systems. While they rested, the ship had passed through a small asteroid field. Mira had always been a light sleeper, so had heard the small pings hitting the side of the ship first. She had been awake and on her way to the flight deck when the alarms went off, signifying a drop in life support abilities. Just like on a plane, you get yourself situated before helping others to get safe. By the time she had finished getting her suit on, air readouts were so low that it was impossible for anyone else to have made it into their suits. She had tried to get to Roger, the captain, and also closest crew member, to the suits into his, but he was already dead. With everything offline, even CPR was impossible. Mira was a glorified mechanic on this ship. Granted, she could fix anything, and was an expert in mechanical engineering among other fields of study. Here, she was Mrs. Fixit. She had had no choice and ended up jettisoning the rest of the crew. She would have liked to return their bodies to their families, but there was no means of refrigeration on board. Assuming she could get the ship working again, they would just begin to stink while they decomposed. And if she couldn't get the ship working again, she didn't want to slowly die to the smell of rot. Most of the life support machinery was in the craft, she had already repaired all of those, and her heart sank knowing she only had one tank of oxygen left and a spacewalk to repair the one bit of machinery on the outside of the craft. Finally, with one hour of air left, the last wires and electronics were replaced. She checked the readout on her arm. Good. Life support systems were coming back online. She would have never been able to do all of this if her crew had survived and were also using up the oxygen tanks. She crawled back to the ship and, once safe, checked the readouts to ensure proper air quality. Everything was good, so she happily removed her helmet and took a grateful lung of air. She hooked an empty air tank to the refill station and headed to the flight deck so she could do a systems check. Hopefully, she would still be able to direct the ship or even communicate with Earth. While she could drive this ship, it was not something she was very good at, and she certainly wouldn't be able to land it anywhere. Mira checked the thrusters next. Her left thruster wasn't working. She brought up the exterior camera and was able to see that the thruster looked like it had taken a direct hit from an asteroid. She wouldn't know how bad it was until she got out and looked. In the meantime, she went to storage for spare parts. After loading up a bag, she went back to the air tanks and switched out the now full tank for an empty one. Mira decided she wanted full air tanks before anything else. She set the repair bag down next to her spacesuit and attached a full air tank to the suit. She really didn't want to report back to Earth just yet. They would ask her if she had done all the necessary repairs to the ship and then likely chew her out for jettisoning the corpses of her crew. She really didn't get why they would expect her to store them. She was a good three light-years from Earth. Messages took days to receive. While propulsion was much quicker than ever imagined, communication had not kept up. Over the last twenty years, the propulsion secrets of spacecraft that had crash-landed on Earth nearly a century ago were unlocked. The first voyage using this new technology was to explore the solar system more extensively than satellites had previously. This was the second voyage, which was to visit our closest neighboring star system, Alpha Centauri. It was supposed to take a week to get there, two weeks to explore and take readings, but not to land, and then a week to get back. Once all of the oxygen tanks were full, Mira went out with her tools and spare parts bag to begin working on the broken thruster. She was about halfway finished when she caught movement from the corner of her eye. What is that? She focused her eyes and realized it was another ship. Oh shit, oh shit, oh shit! She chanted as she pressed the button at her belt to retract the guide rope to pull her rapidly back to the ship. Real freaking aliens! What do I do? She panicked as she began removing the spacesuit and then headed to the flight deck. A strange loud noise hummed through the machinery. Mira had never heard that noise before. She used the exterior cameras to see what was going on and saw that the other ship was right over her own. An opening appeared, and then a light struck the ship. 
There had been some movement of Mira's spacecraft, but she felt it all stop when the light hit. Is that a goddamn tractor beam? Her much smaller craft was brought into the larger, and she soon felt a small jarring as her vessel was set down. There was a new sound that reminded Mira of sonar, as the noise seemed to start from one end of the ship and travel, getting louder and louder as it came to her and the nose of the ship. Once it had gone the whole length of the ship, it stopped. Mira used the cameras to see if she could see what was going on. A panel of wall opened, and a group of beings walked in. They appeared to be speaking to each other, but these cameras didn't provide sound. The aliens were lizard-like in appearance and coloring, except they all had short hair. Were they lizards or mammals? Their hands reminded her of bat feet. They appeared to be dexterous, like her own, but there didn't appear to be any nails or claws. They were a dark green, and each alien had a slightly different shade of the dark green. The heads didn't have a pronounced snout like many Earth's reptiles, but more like a turtle's face. She didn't see any teeth, or at least none that she recognized as teeth, so at least that was good, right? They were bipedal and had tails. They also all appeared to have uniforms on. Mira was panicking. Part of her mind was cataloging every nuance of these aliens, while the rest mentally repeated, oh shit, while it ran in circles. It was quite an odd feeling, really. The one in the center had more embellishments on his uniform, and it waved its hand in what was unmistakably a hello gesture. It fucking waved hello, she gasped, and then it appeared to wait. There were no external speakers on this craft, and due to no microphones on the camera, she didn't even know what they sounded like. She could do a scan, she supposed, but it wasn't meant for something so close. It was meant to scan nearby planets. However, she could at least find out what kind of atmosphere surrounded her ship. She would know if it was breathable, if the pressure was survivable. So she ran the scan. She watched the aliens to see if they would react. The sound of the scan was too high for humans to pick up. It was, however, in a dog's range, so if they reacted or didn't react, it would still tell her something about them. One of them put a hand to the side of its head and appeared to say something. The other two seemed to reply, but made no visible yes or no symbol. So they can hear it, but it doesn't cause discomfort, she mumbled as she looked over the readout. Air concentrations were similar to Earth, but the atmospheric pressure was lower. This would be like being up on a high mountain. It would be difficult to breathe, especially if she went from in the ship to out there without warning. The aliens were moving again. They found the door, and it was opened. She had forgotten to lock it from the inside after coming back on board. Mira cursed herself. She switched to the interior cameras, which did give sound and could be broadcast over. They were speaking to each other as they looked around, poking at the discarded spacesuit and the oxygen tanks. One pointed to the American flag insignia as well as the NASA one, and the other two replied, but again made no other body movement or gesture. They continued down the hall, and the same one that pointed out the exterior camera pointed out the interior one. Their language sounded like hisses and clicks. The same one looked directly at the camera and waved. This time, Mira heard the language that went with it. She pressed the intercom button. She knew they probably wouldn't understand her either, but at least she could try. There was a click when the microphone went live. I can't understand you. The aliens startled briefly with a widening of their eyes. They chattered briefly to each other. Then one of them left quickly, and in the other exterior cameras, she saw it went to a panel at the wall and appeared to speak at something. Inside, the two there looked around curiously but otherwise waited. Outside, a few minutes passed before a door opened and a fourth alien handed over a device to that alien. It then quickly rejoined the other two. It handed the device over to the leader. What is that? She didn't know if they understood her or if it was guessing based on it being a likely question. 
It moved close to the camera and then turned its head to what appeared to be an ear. It pulled the fur away from an area behind the ear, and Mira could see what looked like old scar tissue. It moved back, and the other two did the same to show identical scars. It then mimed using the device on one of the other aliens. It pointed to that alien's mouth and then to its own ear, and then reversed, pointing to its own mouth, to the alien's ear. Translator, Mira supplied. There was no reaction. They waited a little bit, but when Mira didn't appear, they continued forward, looking in each room as they passed it. Mira was still scared. She grabbed a hammer from her tool bag as well as a screwdriver. It was a poor selection of weapons, but they were as familiar to her as anything else would be. The door opened, and she was now staring at three aliens who each stood at around six and a half feet tall. Mira was only five foot two and tiny in proportions, but still she stood in a fighting stance. All three of the aliens flicked out their tongues in the way snakes do to taste the air. She hadn't noticed it on the cameras, but the rational, cataloging part of her mind noted that they each had a bubble around them. It didn't seem to get in their ways. She then remembered their atmosphere was different from hers, and it likely allowed them to be here in her higher-pressured spaceship. As they tasted the air, the aliens tasted her fear. Their eyes widened at that knowledge. After a few clicks and hisses from the leader, the other two retreated from the room. The leader then pointed to her makeshift weapons and pointed to the floor. Its voice got lower and more gentle-sounding as it continued to click and hiss at her. As Mira tried to decide on whether or not to disarm herself, the control started to beep, indicating an incoming message. Shit! she swore. She pointed at the leader with the hammer. You! Go over there! She pointed to an area out of camera range. Mira then turned to the controls, set her hammer and screwdriver in the tool bag, and pressed a button that closed the door to the flight deck. There was a startled hissing from the leader, but she pointed over to the area she wanted it to go. Go! When it moved, she took a look around, took a deep breath, and answered the call. The command center back home would be able to tell how long it took to answer, so she didn't want to cause any alarms back home. She honestly wasn't sure how the government would handle knowledge of aliens and first contact just yet, so she would start with pretending everything was as it had been prior to alien abduction. Sasveta still couldn't understand this strange creature. It was much more expressive than his own people, and the sense of its emotions were pretty universal. It now smelled of both fear and resignation. What was happening on this ancient style of spacecraft? It had at least put down those primitive weapons. He would need to know what this alien said, so used the recording device on his chest so he could review this after the alien's language was added to the translator. Even after he injected the translator behind its auditory canal, it would understand him and his subordinates, but only after it spoke and responded to him would the translator begin deciphering the new language. The video message came up. Commander Morris began speaking. Good day, crew. You should be about a day out from Alpha Centauri. I'm excited to see the images and readings you will be sending back. Because you are so far away, and this is only our second run with this technology, let me know how it's running and if you are feeling any discomfort from the flight speed. Your families have sent videos. Any return videos will be sent back to your families, of course. I look forward to your report. Mira wiped a tear from her cheek and then took a deep breath before turning to the camera feed to respond. Good evening, Commander Morris. I have bad news to report to you. Early this morning, I was awakened by the noise of something hitting the sides of the ship. I was on my way to investigate when the alarm sounded signifying a loss of life support. I hurried to a suit, and by the time I was secure, life support had completely failed. I checked on my crewmates, but they were all dead, with no means to even attempt CPR. Once I realized how badly damaged the systems were, I jettisoned the dead to avoid the decomposition to potentially damage the air quality, and it took me ten hours to make all life support repairs. Once all air tanks had been refilled, 
I assessed the rest of the systems and found the propulsion to be damaged in the port side thruster. I believe the damage was caused by a previously unknown asteroid field. I am exhausted and will work on propulsion tomorrow after I get some sleep. Please send my regrets to my crewmates' families. I believe I'll be able to repair the ship and continue the mission. Mira Rodriguez, out. She turned off the camera and bowed her head, the exhaustion showing itself now that the adrenaline was leaving her. Sisveta took advantage of the alien's lowered guard and sprang at it, using his superior strength to hold it while he injected the translator. It screamed in pain and held itself at the injection site as its red life fluid ran down its neck. That damn alien attacked me, Mira thought as she curled into a ball and sobbed. The pain was unbearable. The injection site burned, and she now had a debilitating migraine. She could feel alien hands on her, cleaning up her neck. <coughs> Hurts. <coughs> pain. <coughs> Go away soon. You should start. <coughs> Be able to understand me. Don't move until the burning and head pain are gone, and the light no longer bothers you. It's okay, little alien. Mira chortled at being called an alien, even though to this alien she was, in fact, the alien here. The noise sent a fresh stab of pain through her head and she cried out at it. Foolish alien, you must stay still. When you are ready, I will need you to speak to me. You must give more than yes or no answers. Your language is new to the translator, so I will not understand you at first. I will also ask you to repeat certain phrases. I look forward to being able to communicate with you properly. Your ship is very old-looking to me, but everything is all brand new. Why is your technology so old? Where in the galaxy are you from? I have so many questions. As he spoke to her, he stroked its strange fur. How odd that it was so long and only on its head. It was very soft, like a new hatchling's fur. The alien was so strange looking to him. He saw the hardened tips on its fingers and wondered if it had toes, and if they also had hardened tips. What was the purpose of these tips? After a few more minutes, Mira moved to a sitting position. Are you feeling well? Yes. I'm a little sore still, but the burning and pain have gone away. Sisveta was surprised at how short a time it took for this alien to be ready to begin. He hadn't had to calibrate his own translator, as his language had already been added to the collective, but he had been in pain for quite a bit longer than this alien. I will need you to repeat a few sentences for me. It will help the translator to understand your language faster. Okay, shoot, Mira replied. He took that to mean to begin. He pulled out his portable and brought up the translator phrases on it and set it to begin calibration. I do not understand. Speak slower. He pointed to her and she waited on the translation and then repeated it in English. I am in need of scale liquid because my shed is coming. Mira bit her lip to keep from laughing at the phrase. Once she was calm, she repeated it. Susveta also found this phrase humorous as his species did not shed and suspected this alien also did not shed. Mystery creates wonder, and wonder is the basis of <coughs> desire to understand. Mira was also a little confused, because she wasn't sure if that was a translation error or not. She did her best. What did you just call me? Sisveta hissed angrily. At the alien's sudden fear scent, he calmed and soon realized it had not been speaking its own language, but had switched to his own. <coughs> Did not translate for you, did it? No, but I heard the translation, and I'm sorry. Being called a cracked egg isn't much of an insult where I'm from, but I can understand why it might be. I understood you that time. I'm sorry I became angry. My language is as difficult to you as yours would be to me. The nice thing is that all translators are connected. Eventually, all who have one will be able to understand you. Now, I would like to refer to you as something other than the alien. How are you called differently? Called differently? Oh, 
You're asking me my name. Name? He thought for a moment. I think so. My name is Mira Rodriguez, but just Mira is fine. Your call differently seems long. I am called differently. <laughs> that did not translate, and now I'm afraid to try it. Sisveta tasted the air. You do not smell afraid. I mean that I worry I will say it wrong and offend you again. Your species fear causing offense? Sort of. My world had many different languages. It is very easy to have certain sounds come together and have them mean something in another language when they may mean nothing in your own. Even gestures mean different things in different cultures. What are gestures? He said the word gestures strangely, proving that the translator only had basic understanding and was still learning the new language. You made the high gesture to my exterior camera, she demonstrated. That does not mean high. I was indicating I was the one in charge. That is a nonverbal way to say hello anywhere on my planet. Sisveta dropped his jaw and held up his tongue. He then closed his mouth. That is the nonverbal way to say hello anywhere on my planet. Mira tried it. Your mouth does not look like it has much flexibility. Mira chuckled. I don't think we use ours for as many things as you probably do. The door to the flight deck opened again, and one of the aliens from before entered and handed Sisveta a belt. Stand. What is? You're called different. Was it not right? It didn't translate. We will get it figured out. For now, put on this belt. It will feel uncomfortable for a few minutes as it adjusts to your species' needs for breath and comfort. Then I can take you to the scanners. It will help us to better understand your various needs. Mira started to become scared. Sisveta centered her fear. Why have you become fearful? Have I said something wrong? Why are you being nice to me? Nice? Sisveta was confused. This was standard procedure for encountering a new sentient species. This alien was his first to set up. Had he done something wrong? He started going through procedures in his mind. He was certain he had done things correctly. If something is too good to be true, then it probably is. You think I have ill intentions? I don't know what your intentions are. My intentions are to ensure you will be safe on my ship, that we can provide correct nourishment, learn about you and your people, and potentially introduce you to the Federation while ensuring your craft and you were not picked up by Hiss, who would sell you to the highest bidder. What are Hiss? Close, but I understood what you were trying to say. It did not translate. The lowest of belly crawlers? Scum? Perhaps. However, I don't think that word is enough. Will you come with me now? He held out the belt to her. She took it and put it in place, then he helped her to secure it. This will feel uncomfortable while it adjusts to your needs. I will help you stay steady. She nodded and he set the control. He was right in that it was uncomfortable. At one point the pressure was so high she nearly fainted and then went the other way and became so light she couldn't breathe. Sisveta kept her calm. Once the pressure was stabilized, Mira felt a prick at her waist. Ow! I apologize. I forgot to tell you. The belt has to analyze your life fluid's oxygen levels. It will take a few more readings that go to our medical staff. We will be going there first after the belt adjusts your sphere to your needs. After a few more minutes, the belt flashed a small purple light. All right, it will be safe for you to leave your ship now. He turned to the door and walked several paces, and when he did not hear the alien following, he turned. Are you unable to walk? No, sorry. Sorry, it was just sudden. I'm coming. He looked into each of the rooms as he headed toward the exit. He finally came upon the kitchen. 
I need you to grab a variety of food items. We will need to scan them to ensure we can get you proper nutrition. Mira grabbed several different food bags. Even though this ship kept its own gravity, NASA still only provided the thick food pastes. She also grabbed a water bag. Your food is all liquid? Mira quickly explained how prior to building ships like this, they did not have gravity on spaceships, so couldn't risk food to get caught in the vent system. That's a rather interesting solution, he replied as they continued to exit the ship. Tasveta led the alien to the medical bay. It gasped as it saw the chief medical officer, Clarude. Greetings and warm rocks to you, Captain Sveta. Is this the alien that has caused so much activity today? Sasveta? Mira asked. Is that how you say your name? Ah, you understood it. It makes sense. Clarude's language has sounds that more resemble your own language than mine. Try telling him you're called differently. All of his language has long been translated. Mira nodded and turned to this new alien. He was very strange looking. He resembled an alligator if they had human length arms and legs. His snout was much shorter, and his skin was orange. Instead of the spiny ridge of an alligator, he had a short purple mohawk that went all the way down his tail. My name is Mira Rodriguez, but you can call me Mira. Mira Rodriguez, or Mira for familiarity. It is pleasant to meet you. Mira looked over at Susveta, who was grinning. It is also pleasant to meet you, Mira Rodriguez. I must return to the controls. I will return a little later. Our chief medical officer will have many questions for you so that we can learn about you. He left, and the medical bay door closed behind him. Clarude ran many scans on Mira as well as her food and asked many questions, some of which were embarrassing. However, he also offered the same kind of information about himself and Sveta. They spoke of her understanding of science, and he filled in some gaps. He asked her where her planet was, and showed her where they had picked her up from. That one there. She pointed when he had found her solar system. We call it Earth. Are you sure? He was looking at Mira dubiously. Of course. She zoomed in on the land masses. This is the country I'm from. It's called the United States of America, or USA for short. That's a class black planet. The temperature changes too frequently, and most of what grows there is poisonous. Poisonous? What exactly is poisonous to you? Here, I have pictures. He showed her pictures of grass and trees and flowers. Some of those are poisonous to me too, but only if I tried to eat it. She moved over to a picture of foxglove. This is both medicine and poison. If I had a heart problem, a medicine that comes from this plant would keep me alive. But to eat even a small amount of this plant would kill me, too. I am not speaking of eating. I am speaking of touching. To break a stem of any of these and have it touch my skin, I would get itch bumps, and if I continue, my lungs would cease functioning. It kind of sounds like an extreme allergy. I get that way with cats, but not to that extreme. At least, not for a long time. I usually start with sneezing first. After scanning her food and water, he let her know that her food was poisonous to the crew, but the water was good for the most part. Small amounts would be okay, but there was trace amounts of plant material in it which would become lethal over time. I'm sorry, Mira, but we cannot replicate your food. However, from the scans I have taken of you, it appears that you should have little problem with our food or hydration liquids. It is very strange how resilient your species is, but you don't appear to have any defensive evolutions. For example, skeeks like Sveta have a venomous bite. They do not have teeth or fangs, but their mouth ridge is sharp all the way to the back of their mouths. My species, Juten, can stiffen and shoot our fur ridge at will. But you humans have no claws, no venom. Your physical strength is on the lower end of the scale. However, your endurance is among the highest, if not the highest of all species. How is this possible? During the course of their conversation, she had learned that while most species were herbivore in nature, 
There were carnivores and even a few omnivores. The fact that humans ate meat was not a terrifying concept for Clarude. In fact, his species was completely carnivorous. This was a relief because talking about predation tactics as she was about to do wouldn't alienate these new species from her. His species and all of the other meat-eating species they had encountered so far used ambush and trap predation in their ancestral pasts and had since moved to herds and even more recently to replication so that they no longer had to kill to eat. Do you understand the term pursuit predator? Mira asked. I understand those separately. Please explain how you mean them. Early in human history, we were nomads that rarely settled and planted crops. Typically, societies were hunters and gatherers, so as a herd of animals migrated from colder temperatures to warmer ones, our ancestors followed them. Many of those animals were much stronger and bigger than us, so we would pursue, wait until they settled for the night, and cause them to exhaust themselves before engaging them. This is called pursuit predation. We may not be faster, but we can run off of less nutrients and sleep than many other stronger animals on Earth. Clarude nodded in understanding. We also learned how to make tools and weapons early on. That makes sense. There are other species that have your nutritional needs, but they are also in your range of stamina. However, they are much stronger and taller than you. Your people are an anomaly, Mira. He paused and took a breath so he could change the subject. Now that I understand where you are from, and you have told me of your mission, where is this Alpha Centauri at? We may be able to give you better information than you would be able to collect on that ancient-style craft. She showed him on the star map. You must not go there! Why, Clarude? What's wrong with that star system? The species that live there are slavers, Mira and what they feel they cannot sell, they eat. I am very sorry your crew is dead, but I am also glad it happened so that your ship put out its distress signal and we could come upon you and your ship. Mira was confused, because they did not send out a distress signal. What is strange is that your planet is not too far from them. How is it that the Imperia have not discovered your people? Two things. First, we didn't put out a distress signal. Clarude interrupted. All ships do when life support is compromised. Your people were copying what they saw when they built your ship. They may not have realized that the thing they copied had such a purpose. What is your other thing? The knowledge that they may have copied tech without understanding other uses made Mira sit down heavily. She was worried as she whispered, What if they did know? Clarude was worried at the sudden change in Mira's disposition. What do you mean? Can you show me what they look like first? Clarude nodded and brought up images of them. Mira gasped. Greys! You have seen them before? No, but my ship, as you know, was designed based on old alien wrecks and their stories of alien abductions and experimentation. Other people just think they're crazy or drank too much. They aren't believed, but people have drawn images of what the aliens that abducted them looked like, and many looked just like that. Mira was beginning to panic, so Clarude had her lay down while he called Susveta to come back. Susveta had watched the interactions he had with Mira that he had recorded. He had been surprised that Mira had not told her superior of himself or his ship. He wondered why. First contact tended to be a joyous thing for new species to know you are not alone. But Mira had not acted like that. She was more afraid at first. He had turned the ship to head back towards Federation space and was still contemplating the record when Clarude messaged him that he was needed back at medical. Susveta entered the medical bay and sampled the air. Mira was distressed, and Clarude was concerned and anxious. What worries you, Clarude? It is Mira, Captain. She was headed to Imperia territory. She said it was their closest star system neighbor. Even worse is when I showed her images of Imperians. She recognized them. Show her images of Vesely and Luxi, Sveta suggested. Mira, 
come and look at these images. Do any look familiar? He held out his hand to her, and she took it. He guided her back to the main viewing screen. Mira pointed to the Vesely. I think I've seen drawings of this one. People call them lizard men or even reptilians. I don't recognize the other one at all. This is troubling, Sisveta replied. These three races work together in the slave trade. There are three main groups that races belong to politically. The Galactic Federation, which we belong to, believe in peace, unity, and moving everyone towards a galaxy where everyone can be healthy, fed, and educated. The neutrals believe more in a my-needs-are-more-important-than-yours mentality. They are not evil, but do not renounce evil things such as slavery. In fact, they have many that enjoy having slaves. This is more individuals than full species that do this. They do not go out and make races as slaves and even have enslaved their own people in some cases, but they do turn a blind eye to the act. Do you understand? Yes. My own people went through having and then later outlawing slavery. Knowing it was outlawed is good to know. It means that perhaps your people would be more likely to join us. The last group only has these three races. They are extremely violent and feed the darker impulses of the neutrals. I don't know, Sveta. Captain, Farood interrupted. He is our captain and should be addressed as such, he explained gently. It's fine for now, Chief Medical Officer Clarude. We are alone and this alien has had many shocks this day. We can be informal in such privacy. You yourself have only called her Mira. Have you even asked her rank upon her ship? Sisveta chided. Sisveta tasted Clarude's embarrassment, so turned back to Mira. Continue. Mira rubbed her face and finally crossed one arm, rested her opposite elbow on it, and held her face covering her eyes with that hand. Her emotions tasted strange that she had so many at once. Fear? Resignation? Trepidation? Hopelessness? Stressed? There were more, but he couldn't separate them. She finally spoke. Humans have a lot of darker impulses, she whispered. What if they have helped to push those? What if some of the things we've done to each other were because of them? We have a lot of empathy. We really do. We care about things we probably shouldn't, but we can't help it. It's how we're wired. But we have so much capacity for harm. I just... It was like watching a puppet with its strings cut as Mira dropped down as though all the energy to hold her standing had left her. Clarude and Sveta shared a glance of worry before Clarude lifted the smaller Mira and set her back onto the medical bed. He moved away, and Sveta pulled up a chair so he could look at Mira at a more even level instead of looking down upon her. I have notified the Galactic Federation Council of you, and they wish to meet you. Hopefully they will come to a decision on what to do with your planet. As you may have guessed, either your people know about the aliens on their planet and have agreements with them, or they do not. You know your government leaders best. What do you think? Mira was about to answer when Sveta noticed how different she looked from when he dropped her off. Wait, he said to her, and then turned his attention to Clarude. Do we know her nutrition and sleep needs? Yes, she is an omnivore who needs two to five meals a day, which is determined by how much is eaten at the meal and eight hours of sleep in a day cycle. How long is her day cycle? We determined that our hour cycle and her hour cycle are similar enough to... Clarude, that isn't what I asked. How long is her day cycle? Twenty-four hours, Captain. Why? Because she looks like a skeetling that is refusing to attend to its sleep cycle. He focused back on Mira. How long has it been since you had last attended to your sleep cycle? Her eyes were still mostly white when he had first seen her, but now they were mostly red. Her eyelids were drooping, and her body seemed to have a heaviness to it with her movements that weren't there before. Mira's thoughts were becoming more and more sluggish, and even this simple math took her far too long to figure out, so she had to do it out loud. Um. 
We each had an air tank with one spare, so six tanks. They each held three hours of air. Fixing the life support systems left me with about an hour left, so that was fourteen hours. Then I had to refill them. That was a lot quicker. Two hours, I think? And then I was fixing the thruster when you picked me up. I think that was a little less than an hour. Sisveta was shocked. I left you here three hours ago. You have been awake for at least seventeen hours before you arrived here. Have you eaten anything? Mira shook her head. Aunt Clarude, I see you ran an endurance test, a speed test, and a full skeletal strain test. Have you even allowed her to rest? Clarude was very embarrassed, and he replied that he hadn't. The human had been nearly non-stop active for seventeen hours, and then endured another three hours of testing. While that was not a full day for her twenty-four-hour day, it was nearly a full galactic day, which was twenty hours. Most species were awake for ten hours and asleep for ten hours. And then he had another realization. This exhausted human had scored so highly in the endurance testing, but was still not the highest, while exhausted. He shuddered at what a well-rested human might be able to do. While Clarude was lost in his thoughts, Sosveta was speaking to Mira. You have my apologies, Mira. We should have ensured you had rest and nourishment. Do you think you can eat or drink anything? Mira replied in the negative. Do you think you can walk a little way so I can get you settled in your room? Sosveta helped her up and shot Clarude a glare. We will speak of this later. Clarude knew he had messed up. He had assumed the new alien would say something. Mira was walking much slower now, but Sosveta understood. Just like he was talking to a tired skeetling that had to be guided to their nest, he kept up a litany of just a little longer, and we're almost there. Once he got her into the room, he had her press her belt against the wall so that the room would now be set to her own atmospheric needs, which he briefly explained, so he could take the belt off of her and set it next to the door. He guided her to the nest, which was circular in shape, with a raised padded edge all the way around. The interior would be soft and plush. Is there anything you need removed for comfort? She struggled to remove her foot coverings, so he helped her to do so. Once they were off, she instinctively climbed into the nest and was soon breathing deeply. He left the room and strode back to the medical bay to have that talk with the chief medical officer. Mira woke up with a start. Where was she? What was she laying on? What woke her up? Was it a noise? As she began to move, the light slowly increased. She was still breathing quickly with alarm as she took in her surroundings. Mira, are you awake yet? Mira realized that was what had awakened her. She had heard the door open. It was Clarude that was calling out to her. Sorta? She called back. She climbed out of the strange-looking but oddly comfortable bed. She knew her hair was probably everywhere, but she was still groggy enough not to care. The bed was separated from a small living area, so she moved past the partition between the spaces. She saw Clarude standing near the open doorway with a cart of food. May I come in? But you're already in? Mira replied, confused. Clarude took a small step forward and put his hand up. It connected to a field of some kind that prevented him from moving further. You must have different customs. These rooms are all made so you cannot hear any commotion going on in the halls. So, if you wanted to visit with someone, you open the door and can enter a small area just inside the doorway. Then you ask permission to enter further. It must be given each time. Sisveta set you as the owner of this room, so you are the one that can allow another to enter. If you allow me to enter, you must say, yes, you can enter, he explained. Yes, you can enter. He grabbed the cart he had brought with him and directed it into the room. The cart was similar to any food trolley you might see back on Earth, except the cart did not have wheels. It hovered at a height that was comfortable to Clarude to push, but wouldn't be for Mira to push. He brought the cart over to a small table that was set low to the ground. 
As Mira studied it, it was set up similarly to the traditional Japanese tables. Instead of cushions spread around the table, there was a place you could sit that had a different look, almost similar to the material of the bed that encircled the table, and there was a space beneath the table for you to put your legs. Mira soon learned that the table could be raised or lowered with a few buttons so that it was at a species' own comfort. In fact, it could even have different levels if different species were sitting at the same table. Clarude brought the cart close to the table and then lowered it so he could take dishes off of it as needed instead of filling the table with foods and hydrations. I must apologize to you. I did not realize how long it had been since your last sleep cycle, and I should have asked. It is part of a new species protocol to ask about needs, and in my excitement I forgot to ask and ensure your needs were being met. There has not been a new first contact within my life cycle, and I let my excitement get in the way of decency. I will do better. He looked down and then back to the food. In that spirit, I would like to introduce you to some food that is offered on board. I didn't know what kind of eating aids your species might use, so I brought some of each we have on board. Some of the utensils were very strange-looking and she wondered at how they might be used. She did see something that looked similar to a spoon, as well as what looked similar to chopsticks, and so chose those. Interesting. Those are the eating aids of the Truic. You haven't met them yet, but they are a nocturnal species and the only other species we have on board. At Mira's confused and anxious body language, he replied, All will be well. We will meet your nutritional needs, and then I will show you the features of your room. Our computers are still analyzing your life fluids so that we can make vaccines for us all. We want to ensure we do not catch anything you may be carrying, and we do not want you to catch anything we may be carrying. It was a bad few first contacts before that became protocol. To those ends, I must ask you to stay in your room until tomorrow. We will vaccinate the crew first, and then I will come and vaccinate you. After a few hours, I will be able to give you a tour of the ship. He could tell she had many questions. Eat first. Worry about the rest after, yes? Once she had agreed, he began showing her various foods, told her if they were meant for herbivores or carnivores. She was the only omnivore on the ship, and let her try them. He had already been able to run scans on anything that would cause her harm, so knew that she would be able to digest any of these foods without issues. After they ate their fill, he showed her the bathroom and how everything worked, and then to the panel for the computer system in the room. He showed her how to contact him and how to have the computer read text so that she could understand it. Her clearance would be basic, so there was no worry that she would get into a part of the computer she shouldn't. Do you have any questions for me before I head back to medical? Yeah, something has been nagging me. Why could I understand Captain Sesveta before he could understand me? Clarude considered how to answer. This was not a classified subject. Even children knew how it worked, but he had to ensure he was answering in line with her understanding of science, as well as in a way not to cause unnecessary fear. You mentioned that there are many languages on your homeworld, yes? Mira nodded. Are there people that can speak many languages? Some people even make that their profession so that they can translate for people. Do you have languages that had a common ancestor but have developed to be different languages? Yes, there are several language families like that, Mira replied. Do you think that if a person already knew many languages, they would have an easier or a more difficult time to learn another? Definitely easier. I had a friend in high school that picked up new languages very quickly. The translator we use is similar. The programming has learned thousands upon thousands of languages. That is why it can understand a new language so quickly. The other half of it is where it is placed. It is able to connect with our brains and learns quickly how to communicate. The translator already understood what the captain said. In the beginning, the language is clunky and more formal. Sometimes the words are almost correct. So, when the captain spoke to you, you thought you were hearing words in your language. 
Instead, you were hearing a basic semblance of emotions and intentions that were turned into words. As we have spoken together, the languages we hear from each other become smoother. This is like a computer program that has learned what you mean when you create shortcuts, and can therefore do similar things before you realize you want to do them. The program is not intelligence. It cannot think on its own. It can, however, learn and adapt to our needs quickly. You can also easily correct it when it adapts incorrectly. I feel like I am over-explaining this. I don't want you to fear it. It cannot make you do anything, nor is it able to listen to your thoughts. I hear that was a bad first contact. The species understood the explanations to believe their own thoughts were not safe. We do not have such a technology. It would be unethical. He shivered at that last thought. Please tell me I have not made further mistakes and caused unnecessary fear or harm. Mira chuckled. We also have program interfaces that become more user-friendly as you use them. Clarude visibly relaxed. Is there anything else? When she replied in the negative, he replied, I must leave then. I'll let the captain know you are awake. I know he had more questions for you. One of us will be by later for the next meal. Contact me if you have any needs. Once Clarude had left, Mira headed over to the bathroom and took a much-needed shower. It was a very strange experience, and at one point she thought she may have changed the setting to D-Shed, but she was clean. She looked around for a brush, but couldn't find one. She finger-combed her hair the best she could, but it was long and thick. She worried about snarls turning into mats, but she should be good for a little longer. She didn't like having to put her dirty clothing back on, but it was all she had in this room. She mentally kicked herself for not grabbing at least a change of clothing when she had had the chance. Clarude had showed her how to use the computer, so she began to explore it. She found a ship map and felt like she was back in college on the first day and trying to find the correct building and classroom all over again. He had set the system to new species, so any time she pressed a button it would read what it was for, and then she would have to tap it again to open the file. It was time-consuming, but she appreciated that someone had thought of it. He had also showed her how she could ask the computer to find something or give a command. She was getting tired of feeling like a kid at a whiteboard solving basic equations, which made her inwardly groan about her math error last night. She pressed the appropriate button, which made a tone. Is there a way to use you from a distance? There was a tone in a different part of the room, and when she turned her head towards it, saw a slow pulsing of light at that corner of the room. Once she got closer, it was what the aliens had referred to as a portable. Thank you, she called out absent-mindedly. Once she picked it up, it activated, showing the same screen as the one on the wall. The portable reminded her of a tablet in some regards, and a chunk of plexiglass in others. When it was powered on, you couldn't see through it, but when it had been laying down, it practically blended into the table it had been resting on. A few hours later found Mira happily looking through the available information on the portable, and even adding in some written language so that she didn't have to have the computer read to her constantly when the door to the room opened. Sisveta was in the entryway with another cart of food. Mira smiled, and before he could say anything, she said, Good afternoon, Captain Sisveta. You may come in. You are learning quickly, I see. It is a meal break for me, and I thought it was a good opportunity to continue our conversation from last night, and to also ensure that you received nourishment. I hope you do not mind, but I have only brought non-meats. The Jutan are the only carnivores on board, and it is difficult for me to be around their food if I don't need to be. That's absolutely fine. She moved over to the table and set part of the table to a height similar to what Clarude used so that it wouldn't be difficult for him to sit. Clarude had had to raise his side before sitting down last time. They sat down and he explained the dishes briefly. Before we start, I just want to say that I really can do basic math. I'm so embarrassed. You were exhausted. It would have been rude for me to point it out while you were in such a state. 
Twenty-three hours is a long time to be awake and aware. Is that a normal amount of time a human can be awake? Sort of. It's usually not by choice. The longer we're awake like that, the harder it is to do things, as you saw. How long can humans stay awake for? Skeets will be unconscious after seventeen hours, whether we like it or not. Adrenaline won't keep you awake? The first word did not translate. What is it? It's a chemical one of our glands will secrete when we are in a state of stress, high excitement, or if there's a threat to survival. It makes your heart beat faster, clears your sinuses, and can even allow you to run faster or lift heavier than your normal ability for a short time. If it gets triggered, but you don't end up needing the boost, it still gives your heart a faster beat and makes your hands shake. I do not believe we have that chemical. Can I have you say the word into my portable, and I will see if the Juten have a similar word? She did so. So how long can your people force themselves to be awake? I don't remember what the record was exactly. I remember it was something crazy like over a week. At Sasveta's confused look, she said, Our week is seven days. His eyes widened. I think the longest I went was about two and a half days due to insomnia. And then she had to explain what insomnia was. He was shocked that a species' own body could force them to stay up for so long against their will. After they ate, Sasveta asked about what she remembered of their conversation prior, and then if she had thought about it. Mira collected her thoughts. She, of course, thought of how much she should reveal to aliens, but her instincts were telling her that they could be trusted. She did have a few questions, and had even written them down with the help of the portable. You have concerns. I can see them on your face and scent them in the air. Ask. Mira let out a heavy sigh. He was right. She was concerned. We have people that point giant listening devices at star systems. We are able to pick up the sounds that stars make, and even some planets. We have broadcasted all kinds of signals into space. Why haven't we encountered each other before? It's a good question, and I can think of a few possibilities. It could even be more than one thing happening together. I'm not sure. One of the possibilities I have thought of is that you recognized both the Imperia and the Vesely. If they had started to come to your planet before your people started this broadcasting and listening, they would have the means to intercept those transmissions and give only what they wanted you to know. It is the same for any of our transmissions that might have made it out to your planet. They could have intercepted them and obscured the sounds until it only sounds like static. The other possibility that I thought of was that our systems of communications may not be compatible with each other. Your ship style was ancient to me, but the communication system you are using was very foreign to me. That could simply be because it is something we have not used for a long time, and I do not have an interest in outdated technologies, or it is something we have never used. It could easily fall into either of those categories. How would they be able to destroy incoming and outgoing communications like that? That would be very easy, I'm afraid. In fact, it causes strange lighting in the sky under certain conditions. Strange lighting? Yes, the particles it pulls out interact with the light from your sun and would create great sheets of light in the sky. Mira's eyes grew larger than he had seen before. You have seen this effect? Mira nodded dejectedly. We call it the Aurora Borealis. They both sat in silence for a while, lost in their own thoughts. To answer your question from last night, I could see it going either way. Earth governments control knowledge they think could cause fear. They knew they had an alien spacecraft that had crash-landed over a hundred years ago, but they denied its existence until they had understood everything they could about it and could mostly replicate it. By the time the government released any information, they spoke in certainties. They wish to appear confident. I think that is pretty common amongst all species, Sisveta added. Mira nodded and continued. On the other hand, people have claimed to see these aliens, and instead of being taken seriously, 
They were ostracized, made fun of, and were treated like the town drunk. So I really don't know. Mira smelled stressed. It's all right. We will help you to figure it out. We will arrive at the Federation meeting site the day after tomorrow. There are many wise thinkers that can help us to handle the situation in the best way possible. Do you have other questions for me? Why would the Imperia and the Vesely do this? What is the purpose? I mean, they haven't enslaved the population and the general population doesn't even know they're there. I have thought of a few possibilities for that, too. I hesitate to voice them because I do not want to cause you unnecessary fear. Say them. I'm probably thinking them, and it would be nice to know that I'm not working myself into a panic over nothing. Clarude has been keeping me informed on his progress with the vaccine. He has found your species to be very... hearty. I think that is the right word. You are well adapted to fighting off most diseases you might get from us. We are having a harder time to be able to say the same. To this end, they may be looking for a way to infect your people with a way to reduce your empathy. This is something their people would find a weakness, and it's possible that they are looking to add humans to bolster their numbers, to have you become like them. I don't think they'll succeed in that. Why are you so certain about that? Humans can bond with just about anything, even the inanimate. For example, it didn't seem odd to me to thank the computer for showing me where the portable was. And I have absolutely apologized to my car for going over a bad pothole in the road. Sisveta let out a loud hiss, but the translator quickly translated it to laughter. How very strange. Yes, I think they would have that problem as well. It is good to hear that they will fail if that is their intent. You said a few possibilities. That was one. What are the others? Sisveta took a deep breath to calm himself. If they are not looking for an alliance, then I fear they would be seeing if humanity would make better slaves or better meat. I think our fears have the same lines of thought. Do not fret. Clarude believes the vaccine will be ready tomorrow, and the Federation will be able to offer answers and hope. Today is not a time for worries. From what you have said, the Imperia and the Vesali have had a long time on your planet. A few days will not change things. Mira met his gaze. Unless my crew and I were to be their first test subjects on slavery or meat... Sesveta hadn't taken his thoughts that far. Let us hope that it was not the case. It makes sense for your first out-of-system flight to be to the closest star system. It is a natural place to head to. It is just unfortunate that the Imperia homeworld is in that star system. Will you be well? Mira nodded. Try not to dwell on it. I know it will be difficult, but if any of that is the case... You are still heading in the best direction it is possible to go. I know. Here, let me help you get everything together. He let her help him set everything back on the cart before heading back out of her room. If you enjoyed this story, please subscribe and leave a comment that says, I subscribed. I will heart every single one of them. Thank you for your time.